Well, we all just sang the words, O great God of highest heaven. Do you believe those words? It's a truth we can find in the word of God. We can read it in the pages of scripture. Is it a truth that you affirm? You see, because it moves on, O great God of highest heaven, glorify your name through me. That's, that's the proof in the pudding, as some might say. That's how you know it's actually playing out. When, when, when it moves from your head to your heart, when, when it moves from a, a mental assent or affirmation of a truth and it moves down into a heart that then says, I'm going to live this truth out in my life. I want it to be something that is seen, something that changes the way that I act, something that changes the way I speak, something that changes the way I behave and parent and work and neighbor and everything else in your life. It changes fundamentally the way you live. That's what truth is meant to do. We're continuing our study in Luke chapter 11. I would encourage you, if you have your Bibles, please turn there. Luke chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible, uh, there's a, a Bible in front of you in the pew. Pick it up. We're on page 869. And um, I'd love for you to, to follow along. You need to see the truths of the Word of God so that you know it's not, just, it's not just coming from me. It's not my authority that matters. Really, it doesn't matter what I say. What matters is what God says. And, and if God says it and you read it and you can see it, then it's something you need to live by. And since he's the great God of heaven, in the highest heaven, as it were, then it should fundamentally change the way you live. The truth is really important. And uh, quite honestly, I come to a passage this morning. We're talking about demon possession. <laughs> Who wants to talk about demon possession? Not me. I mean, not, not only does it seem very remote, it kind of seems distant. It just seems like... <laughs> Is it really applied? Does it really matter? Is it something really that I, I, need to, I need to know about? Should we spend an entire Sunday working through this passage? And then there's the, the, the flip side of the coin that says, well, as soon as we open the door to that, now we gotta watch out. Do we wanna do that? <laughs> Not really. And as I, as I come on Saturday nights and as I pray for us as a church, as I pray that God would guide my own heart, I just say, Lord, help me not to be a person of fear. Um, the truth is we are in a spiritual war. The conflict that you face every single day is not a conflict with people, a conflict with systems, a conflict with your boss or your spouse or whoever else you, you put in that blank. It is not a conflict with flesh and blood as we saw and read from Ephesians chapter six. It is a conflict that is spiritual, a conflict with demonic forces. That's the conflict that we face. And we live today in a kingdom. And you can pick between one of two. There are only two options. There's the kingdom of this world and there's the kingdom of God. Which kingdom do you belong to? That's where we are today. From the very start, Jesus has come to invite us to enjoy and participate in the kingdom of God. Are you a kingdom of God kind of person? Have you given allegiance to the king of the universe, God himself? That's the only one that matters. He's the only kingdom that matters. And Jesus, from the very beginning, has been trying to invite the, the people that he's been speaking with, his his brothers and sisters, as it were, those who were fellow Jews, inviting them in. Will you, will you enjoy and participate and be part of the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of this world? From the very beginning, Jesus' ministry has been marked out by, by that call. In Luke chapter four, we, we saw there at the very beginning of his ministry, his public ministry in Galilee, Jesus is saying, I must preach the good news of the what church? the kingdom of God to the other towns as well for I was sent for this purpose. I want to invite people to enjoy and taste the kingdom of God. It's present, it's here, it's available. 
Are you a kingdom of God kind of person? Then we move to Luke chapter 8. We see this continuing mark of, of, of Christ's ministry. Soon afterward, Jesus went on through the cities and villages proclaiming and bringing good news of the kingdom of God. So what do you suppose when Jesus now sends out his disciples in Luke chapter 9, well, what do you think their, their objective is? Yeah, you got it. It says in verses 1 and 2, he called the 12 together. He gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal. And then in the next chapter, in Luke chapter 10, he sends out the 72. What do you suppose their mission is? Well, it's the same. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and every place where he himself was about to go to heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come upon you. It should be no surprise then as we enter in to Luke chapter 11 that the preeminent theme from this chapter until Luke chapter 18 is the kingdom of God. And, and not just the presence of the kingdom, but now we're really entering into the kingdom in conflict. There is a war because there is no neutral ground. You have to pick sides. You're on one side or the other side. You're, you're, you're a part of the, the kingdom of this world, which means that, as Ephesians chapter two, 2 says, you are following after the prince of the power of the air. You are a child of disobedience, and you are a son who is destined for wrath. The wrath of God will come upon the children of disobedience. Or you show allegiance to the king of kings and the lord of lords and you enjoy the kingdom of God that Jesus has meant and brings and welcomes people to participate in. So, where is your allegiance today? What we're gonna see in verse 23 of chapter 11, Jesus will, will help bring this kingdom conflict to the very front, front and center. He says in verse 23, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. There is no neutral ground. You have to pick sides. You can't be a, a, a casual observer. You are representing and pledging allegiance to one kingdom or the other. So what are the marks of this kingdom? The kingdom of this world, what, what can we expect to see in the kingdom of this world? Well, you can expect to see rebellion because as, as God is encouraging and calling, he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. He says, therefore, submit yourself to God. Submission is the, is the preeminent theme that runs through the, the course of those who are kingdom followers. They submit their hearts to God and they submit their hearts to the people that God has put over them. So you can imagine that those who are representing the kingdom of God will be those who reflect this attitude of submission to God. But those who are part of the kingdom of this world are gonna show in their heart a heart of rebellion. It's gonna ooze out of them. Um, maybe one of your kids, like one of mine, is a part of a, of a, um, a sport team in high school. And wouldn't you know that the schools now have to have kind of a, a special training time for the parents of students who are playing a sport, whatever that sport is. And that training time goes a little like this. If you want your kids to enjoy the sport, then you need to keep your mouth shut. And you need not to complain and criticize the referees because there's a shortage of referees and we need to show respect to those who are in charge, otherwise your kids are not gonna be able to play. You ever been a part of one of those training sessions? That's because that's the spirit of our age. That's, that's what we're living. We're living in a culture that is given to rebellion because that's what Satan does. He wants to go against submission to God and so he, he, he's, he's creating this philosophy have your own way. Stand up for your rights. Do it for yourself. Take charge. And so maybe you read the, the little news article this past week of that parent who sucker punched a referee. Maybe you read that? This is the spirit of our age. This is the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of the devil. In materialism, 
Materialism is, a, is, another, is another indication of, of, a, of a culture that has given way to worldly, demonic, sensual thinking because, because God calls us to set our minds on things above, not on the things of this earth. And so as we, as we stockpile here, as we, as we gain comfort here, as we try to, to build our revenue here, and it, it takes us off, our, our eyes off of the things there. And so we're laying up treasures here rather than laying up treasures there. And Jesus is emphatic about what that means. You cannot serve God in money. It doesn't mean that you can't have money. It just means the posture of your heart is not to pursue money, but, to, but pursue Christ. We all know that this materialistic mindset has shown up in just the, the debt that is so prevalent across our nation. Um, the exponential runaway debt, the deficit of our, of our country, it's mind-boggling. We can't even begin to comprehend the numbers. But it also boils down to even our own personal decisions. The mortgage balances, um, statistics will show that mortgage balances shown on consumer credit reports have increased by 254 billion during the fourth quarter of last year alone. Increased by 254 billion dollars. That's mind boggling. Balances on home equity lines of credit increased by 14 billion. It's the third quarterly consecutive increase and the largest increase seen in more than a decade. Credit card balances saw a 61 billion increase in the fourth quarter. Credit card balances now stand at 986 billion. Auto loan balances have increased. Other balances like retail cards and consumer loans and student loan balances now stand at $1.6 trillion. We are a culture given to consumerism and materialism. We want it now and we'll have it however we can. We could talk about anger. We could talk about the trends that have been prevalent in our society for the last several years, this growing trend of escalating violence and crime across our country. It is the spirit of the age. It is those who have given themselves to the kingdom of this world. There are only two kingdoms. Which kingdom? To which kingdom do you belong? The kingdom of this world or the kingdom of God? So this morning, as we look into our passage uh, in, in, in verses 14 to 26, we're going we're gonna to begin to see Jesus will, will help us begin to understand these kingdoms, these kingdoms that are in conflict. What does it look like? What, what do we need to pay attention to? And, and what do we do? How do we respond to, to the truths that are in front of us? Jesus will begin in, in, in verse 14, and he's doing the same thing he's been doing all along. We, we see the presence of the kingdom of God coming through in the power and ministry of Jesus Christ. It is, it is so prominent. It's so prevalent. Notice in verse 14 of chapter 11. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the people marveled. At this point in Jesus' ministry, casting out demons was just commonplace. It, it was the norm for, for Jesus in ministry. I think I gave you uh, several instances in your notes you can kind of reference. I think uh, all the way up to chapter 11, there are at least 10 specific references to Jesus casting out demons. It was because Jesus came to demonstrate the power of God over the power of the king, kingdom of, kingdoms of this world. Although it may appear, this, uh, this event may appear to be the same as what we find in Matthew chapter 12, that event in Matthew chapter 12 happened in Galilee. This happens in Judea towards the tail end of Jesus' ministry. Casting out demons has become commonplace. In the Gospel of Luke alone, we have seen this, pr this prominent theme of, of not only the kingdom uh, of God that has come upon the people, but, but, that, but that Jesus is demonstrating kingdom authority by casting out demons, showing that God has power. Repeatedly, this miracle, almost in every instance, will help to affirm that the kingdom of God has come. 
It was meant to be emphatic. It was meant to be a showcase, not for the social reform that Jesus was trying to bring, not, not for, the, not for the, the, the help that, that Jesus was trying to, to give in terms of, of helping people in their physical issues so much as, as promoting the primary goal of the power of God over the kingdom of this world. Jesus will heal this mute man. In every instance that Jesus heals, in every healing that Jesus does, we'll see that the healings are always immediate, there's always, they're always complete, and they're always full, that there's full restoration that's happening. And this is what true healing involves. The presence of the kingdom of God had come. And now the people are given a chance to respond. We see that in the next few verses. The crowd's response to the kingdom of God. The first response is captured for us at the end of of verse 14. It says, the people marveled. They marveled. We, we've seen this already. This is the word for amazed, to, to be in wonder, to, to be astonished. They, they saw this miracle for what it was. This truly was the power of God working out in their midst. They, they saw it for what it was. They, they marveled at Jesus in the words that he was sharing, the miracles that he was doing. But notice in verse 15, there's a, a different response as well. It says, but some of them said... He cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. The crowds respond to the kingdom of God. Some marveled, but others, as we see here in in verse 15, some assigned this miracle to Beelzebul. It uses the contrastive word, the the Greek text will use this contrastive word, but, which is supposed to be this this flag that that stands to say, this is significant, pay attention. Some said this, we find, in verse 15. In verse 17, we'll we'll find that, that Jesus, in responding to their thoughts, will respond. So, you can kind of get the sense that, that some were, were speaking, perhaps whispering to one another, I think this is from Beelzebul. Others were just thinking it in their head, in their heart, and Jesus is responding now. But notice their conclusion. Their conclusion isn't that a miracle didn't occur. Their conclusion is that supernatural events took place, but rather than assigning this to God, they assigned it to Beelzebul. Well, who was Beelzebul? Beelzebul is another term, another name for Satan. It uses and combines two Hebrew words and kind of puts them together. Baal, which is the first part of this word, means Lord. The Zebul, which is the second part of the word, means exalted dwelling. One commentator says the name which means Lord of the Flies is a disdainful corruption of Beelzebul, which is the chief god of the Philistine city. You remember Baal, that was the the god of the Canaanites during the reign of of, uh, uh, King Ahab and and Queen Jezebel. It was the worst name they could think of to associate with the miracles of Jesus Christ. Their use of that derogatory name couched their blasphemy in the vilest possible manner. They called, excuse me, They they called the highest, the holy one. They called him the lowest and most evil. They called the one who is purely good, purely evil. They called God the devil. They called perfect holiness, wickedness. They called truth incarnate, a liar. And they branded the son of God, a servant of Satan. Why would they assign this miracle to Beelzebul instead of to God, it was for one reason and one reason only. It's because they did not want to recognize the hand of God, the finger of God that we see in verse 20. They would not assign it to God because they did not want to assign Jesus as representing God because they hated him. They had pledged allegiance to a different kingdom without even knowing it. And they didn't love God or align themselves with the kingdom of God. They hated Jesus' message, 
They hated the attention that Jesus was getting wherever he went. They hated that Jesus was, was blowing up their traditions. They hated that Jesus claimed to be able to forgive sins. They hated the way that he associated himself with sinners. They hated feeling insecure about their eternity. They hated feeling guilty whenever they are around Jesus because he continually pointed out, you brood of vipers. They hated that Jesus demanded that his people follow after him. They hated him and decided that Jesus did not fit into their kingdom perspective. Of course, they were right. Jesus didn't fit in their kingdom perspective. What they had wrong is they, they, they believed that they were defending the law, they believed they were defending God, but they were actually in the kingdom of this world rather than, than aligning themselves behind the kingdom of God. And Jesus will say about them in John chapter eight, verse 44, you are your father, you are of your father, the devil. This is a war of kingdoms. And Jesus will make this, this clear in his next several statements where Jesus will confront their kingdom mindset. We see that in verses 17 to 20. Notice verse 17. He, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And a divided household falls. If Satan is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it, but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. I see four arguments that Jesus uses as he's trying to walk his audience through a progression of understanding how can you not see what is, should be clear in your face? He begins with a logical argument that we see at the very beginning of verse 17 and 18. Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. In summary, Jesus is saying, you're being ridiculous. Think this through. Think about this rationally and logically. How does this work out? How is it possible that I can be casting out demons for the entirety of my ministry and you can actually see this work of God and assign it to Satan, that makes no sense at all. Satan would not do this. Satan wouldn't take territory and then willingly give it up. You don't do that when you're at war. Satan's goal is to destroy God's kingdom, not his own. His kingdom is unified in that evil intent. Therefore, to argue that he would empower Jesus to cast out demons on an unprecedented scale, thereby destroying his own kingdom, is ridiculous. Second, he uses a personal argument. If I cast out demons by Beelzebul, who do your sons cast them out? And in speaking about sons, Jesus is speaking to, to those who were, who were part of the heritage of, of the Jews. Those, not necessarily their direct descendants, but those who they, who they would call as, as children of Israel, as it were. And they would ascribe the work of God in casting out demons for their, their um, fellow brothers of Israel. So if they're casting out demons by the hand of God, then... Why would you ever assign this same work to a different individual? Why would you assign the same work that you accredit to God and now assign that same work now to Beelzebub? That makes no sense. Third, he uses this, a biblical argument. Take note of the finger of God, Jesus will say. If it is by the finger of God, in verse 20, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The only option is that God did this. And thus, this was a kingdom issue. Jesus is using this phrase, the, king, uh, the finger of God, and, and, and those who were listening, especially those who were part of the religious elite, would have understood exactly where Jesus was drawing that phrase from. And Jesus is looking back to the time where, where Moses was used instrumentally to speak to Pharaoh and to do special works those special works involves several various things. 
But when Moses struck the dust with his staff and produced swarms of gnats, although the sorcerers and the magicians up to that point were able to reproduce every miracle up to that point, this one they could not reproduce. And it was those same magicians working for Pharaoh that ascribed the work of Moses to the finger of God. They saw it. These heathen men, these sorcerers, these who were devoted to demons, these who were magicians in Pharaoh's host, those who served other gods, had the special clarity and illumination to be able to see what was visible in front of them. The finger of God did this. And yet those who called themselves spiritual, those who were part of the religious elite, were unable to see what those sorcerers back in Moses' day were able to see. The clear finger of God should have been unmistakable that the kingdom of God had come upon them. This is not the first time that Jesus has said the kingdom of God is here. And Jesus was speaking about the kingdom presence. He was speaking about the power of God that was evident. He he was speaking about the prophetic witness and the testimony of those prophets from the past who were speaking about what the Messiah would do and Jesus in in carrying out and casting out demons was, was stating emphatically, I am that man. We saw in Luke chapter four, verses 18 and 19. We saw that Jesus now incorporates that phrase to himself that had been spoken by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 61. It says, he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. He has sent me to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Two of the five marks of the Messiah showed up in Jesus liberating demon-possessed individuals, those who were occupied by foreign forces, Jesus set them free. It should have been a clear, indisputable, indisputable proof of the finger of God. Now Jesus will illustrate with a story. It's a story that we have seen before. It's a story that he's kind of used before, but there are some differences. But in, and in this story, we find this fourth argument, this strategic argument that, I, that I is, I'm, I'm calling it, this maybe military argument that I'm referring to. In verse 21, he says, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But one stronger, when one stronger, then he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. The point is this. The palace is the human heart, the human life. The strong man that Jesus is referring to is a, is a man that has given himself to the power of the enemy. The one who is stronger than him, who comes and conquers this palace and takes control is Jesus himself. He removes the armor and he divides the spoil. He establishes that the kingdom has power to overcome the kingdom of this world. The palace has been claimed by a new conqueror, made part of a new kingdom. Those who enjoy the plunder are those who work with the conqueror. And Jesus is establishing that there are two kingdoms that are here. You are either with me or you're against me. There is no neutral ground. You either work with God or you work against God. One commentator writes this, in fact, the the whole human race may be precisely divided into these two categories, which the Lord Jesus Christ enumerated in verse 23. There are only two groups of people, those who are with Christ and those who are against Christ, those who are gods and those who are Satans, those who are in the kingdom of light and those who are in the kingdom of darkness, those who are righteous and those who are unrighteous. Everyone lives and dies in one of those two groups, which have distinct and opposite eternal consequences. To which kingdom do you belong? To which king have you pledged your allegiance? Finally, in our passage today, Jesus uses a strange parable. A parable that you wonder, how does this fit? Where is the correlation? 
Jesus, where, where are you going with this? I, I don't really understand. And let me read this for you and, and tell you what, what I think Jesus is trying to accomplish here. He says in verse 24, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. And finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of the person is worse than the first. What in the world is Jesus talking about, and why does Jesus put this here? You see, I believe that those who were levying the argument against Jesus that he was actually working for Satan may have had a, a, a legitimate gripe with the ministry that Jesus was doing. Because if you can imagine that Jesus, in working through Galilee, and, and Jesus working now through Judea, and casting out demons wherever he goes, every heart that has been cleansed and yet does not pledge their allegiance to the new king, King Jesus, has now become vulnerable and open for new attacks. And that was happening, by the way, in unprecedented levels. So that those who experienced a degree of freedom, those who had enjoyed a, a level of, of liberation from God in being cleansed from demons were now wide open because even in their freedom they did not choose to align themselves with Christ and so now they became vulnerable. And now the last state was worse than the first. And, and, and so those who were, who were throwing this criticism against Christ were, were seeing the results of that very pattern that was taking place. And so they were seeing a life that had been, had been liberated from Satan and now a life that was worse than it was at the beginning. And they're thinking, this guy's working for the enemy. But, but the truth is this. The truth is we see the same thing all around us today. You and I both have been acquainted and, and, and the more we live the Christian life, we become acquainted with those who attend church and enjoy a taste of the freedom that comes in being a part of a, a Christian community. The, 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 the special fellowship they get from, from believers, the, the exaltation in worship and, and, the, and the special feelings that they, that they sense from the people around them who truly love Jesus and the teaching of the word that, that convicts their heart, but there's no real allegiance that's pledged to Christ, and so they open themselves up for something worse when everything is done, when they walk away. It's like the seed, the parable that Jesus talks about back in chapter eight, the parable of the soils. And, and remember that in the second soil, the seed falls onto the rocky ground, and, and it says, this describes somebody who receives the word with joy. That's a Christian, right? But when testing and trials and challenges come, the true nature of their faith shows up in withering away. Hardship and suffering embitter them towards the teaching of the word in allegiance to Christ, and they want nothing to do with him. And then the seed that lands in the soil that has the thorns. They, they, they grow up. They, they receive the word of God with joy again, but they're choked out by the pleasures of life. And then they want nothing to do with God. Jesus is describing these kinds of individuals. Those who enjoy a taste of spirituality for a time. There's a measure of freedom, but as soon as life uh, presents them with challenges and they have not placed their allegiance to Christ, have given him their life, they actually open themselves up for worse disaster. So what do we do with all of this? To which kingdom do you belong? How, how do we take the, the truths that we've learned in our passage today and, and begin to apply them to our lives here in 21st century Western culture? First, I want to encourage us to recognize the dangers. Recognize the dangers of this world. Look around. The Apostle Peter says, Be sober, be vigilant, keep your eyes open, be watchful, know what is happening in the world around you. Several years ago, I was teaching through Ephesians chapter 6. This is the, the, the passage that deals with the spiritual 
uh, armor, right? He says, put on the, the, the breastplate of righteousness. Put on the shield of faith. Put on the, 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 have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. All, all of those things to help prepare us for this, this battle that we're in, right? And towards the end of this study, it, the, the book that we were walking through touched on the issue of, of demonic um, uh, oppression and uh, de- demonic possession. And I thought to myself, I have no idea what to say about this. But I have a friend who has grown up in Africa and a friend who has done missions in Africa their, their entire life. And I said, Richard, you've probably seen this much more than I have. Help me with this. And he said, you know, Andrew, if you were to come to Africa and you were to come to a church, one of, one of the churches that I, that I serve in, and you were to see somebody who were to fall down on the ground, were to convulse, their eyes roll back in their head and start speaking in other, in other uh, languages and start speaking with other voices, you would say, demon possession. And you'd be right. But if I were to bring an African with me to America and they were to see a culture that is so immersed in materialism and consumerism, if they would see the spirit of rebellion against authority, that is so prevalent in America. And they were to see the anger and violence that is happening there, they would say, demon possession. Sometimes we're so blind, aren't we, to the kingdom that we're actually living in. You see, what they would be saying is true. So be aware of the danger of materialism. One of the most prominent targets of the Lord during his ministry is to help his listeners understand that kingdom followers will have kingdom priorities as we find in Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 to 24. He says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. This is a kingdom perspective, a kingdom allegiance. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Which master have you pledged your allegiance does this mean that you, that you can't have wealth? Does this mean that you can't be rich? No. It just means that you can't pursue it. It means that you need to make God the king of your heart, not money the king of your heart. So it should, make, should be uh, very obvious to us that, that those who are part of this kingdom and preaching for this kingdom, those false teachers who would seek to invite us to enjoy this kingdom will have the same perspective, and they do. It's no wonder the telltale sign of the end of the age and the telltale sign of the prophets who appeal to this world have this characteristic. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. They have hearts that are trained in greed. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of wickedness. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 5 says, Understand this, in the last days, there will, will, be, there will become times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. There's a kingdom allegiance materialism that I'll tell you what it is so appealing isn't it it's so hard for us to to cut those things off and pursue the things that are right but also the danger of rebellion against authority those same false teachers that we saw in second Peter they're known for their posture towards authority in second Peter chapter 2 verses 9 and 10 it says The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passions and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. 
They have rebellion in their heart. They have not chosen to submit to God. Jude will say the same thing in speaking about false teachers when he says, yet in like manner these people also relying on their dreams defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. We're all familiar with the story of King Saul who rejected the teaching and instruction of God to destroy the Amalekites. Samuel will come and confront King Saul and say these words we find in 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23. Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Your rebellion, King Saul, is the same as worshiping demons. Wow, that's heavy. There's no wonder why there's such strong discipline in the Old Testament for rebel kids. Do you realize that rebel kids were stoned? There's a reason for that. And there's also strong advice for churches who have rebel people. Titus 3, 10 to 11 says this, as for a person who stirs up division, after, war after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. That's heavy. It's because rebellion is a signpost that says whose kingdom you belong to. At least whose kingdom your heart is bent towards. And then the danger of anger. The danger of anger. Ephesians chapter 4, 26 and 27 says this. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Don't allow anger to have its way in your life. Don't let even one day go by without dealing with that anger. Because when you do, you open your heart. You open the door of your heart to all kinds of other influences. Demonstrate a conviction to pursue God, not anger. Now, don't take matters in your own hands. Vengeance belongs to him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 12 says, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Don't allow anger and violence have anything to do with who you are. So how do we respond? What do we do? Quickly, align your heart with God. Align your heart with God. There is only one solution, and that is to pledge your allegiance to the kingdom of God. Let him be king of your life. That's what Jesus is saying here. You're either with me or you're against me. Choose your side. Choose your king. Align your heart and rely on the strength that God gives through his Holy Spirit. I love how the Apostle Paul will pray for the church in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 and following. He says, I bow my knee to the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not that one. Oh, it is that one. Wow, how do I have that one? From whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner man. You can be strong, but not your own strength. Only the strength that you have as you submit your heart to the power of God. Pledge allegiance to the kingdom of God, and you will see the power of God working in your life. Oh God, I pray that you would help us. Help us to be vigilant and watchful and clear-sighted in recognizing the dangers that are all around us and help our hearts not to be sucked in. Help us to enjoy the kingdom benefits, the kingdom strength that we have through your spirit and through your word. May we represent you well in this world as we seek to do what Jesus did and that is inviting people to participate in the kingdom of God that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. If there's anyone here this morning, Lord, that doesn't know you as their Savior, I pray that even now, your spirit would convict their hearts and draw them to faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming. God bless you.